Hey guys, how's it going? I'm Mel from Mel Did It Herself, and I'm a social service worker turned furniture refinisher, DIYer, small business owner, and content creator. I've learned everything I know about these industries thanks to people who shared their knowledge on the internet, so I'm paying it forward by bringing you my tips, lessons learned, and sharing my journey in this space with you. So thank you so much for being here, being curious, and being a lifelong learner like me. Let's hop into it. Welcome, 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 my friends. I am so looking forward to today's episode because we are going back to basics and starting from scratch for those who have never taken on a furniture makeover or refinishing project before. If you are a seasoned flipper, I hope there will still be some goodies for you in here too that you've maybe never thought about or can at least pass on to someone in your life, so make sure you stick around. And if this is your first time ever taking on a furniture piece, let me just pump you up a little bit first, because I know for some people it can seem intimidating or you might be worried that you'll screw it up or that it won't look good or that you won't know what to do. Let's just say adios to those thoughts right now. Leave them at the door. Positive thoughts and intentions only and truly you don't need to worry about it. It's not a huge deal and worst case scenario, if it turns out horrendous, you can always just strip it back to bare bones again and try another approach. No biggie, you got this. I also wanna put a disclaimer here because as much as I love doing furniture refinishing and have been doing it for well over two years now, I'm not a quote unquote expert. I'm not professionally taught and I know everything that I know from things I've learned from people on the internet and through some trial and error. So grain of salt, do your own research where you feel like you need to do so, and always read the instructions for proper use of any product that you're using in a furniture makeover. But also use that as motivation, because it wasn't that long ago that I took on my first project and had absolutely zero clue what I was doing. If you haven't heard that story yet, head over to episode one after you're done here to hear the origin story of Mel did it herself. All right, so let's tackle your first ever furniture flip. Are you excited? Step number one is acquiring your piece. Next week's episode, we will be discussing where and how to do this in much more detail, but wherever possible, when you're first starting out, start with something free or at least very inexpensive. Think curbside finds on garbage day, posts on your local buy nothing group on Facebook, free postings on Facebook Marketplace, or even something you just have sitting around in the storage room of your basement that you've maybe been meaning to get rid of. I also recommend starting with a small piece in terms of size. So a small side table, chest, um, coffee table, whatever. And then that way the project won't be a big investment to try out because you got it for free or for very little money and you won't have to invest in a large quantity of products that are required to refinish the project. And it won't seem as overwhelming to tackle it in terms of size or the amount of time that you'll have to invest to finish it. And so you'll get that quick win and that immediate gratification of being like, yeah, I can do this. We love quick wins. So once you have your piece, step two is to remove any hardware like the knobs or pulls slash handles that might be on it. Maybe there's hinges and those kinds of things and then clean the whole piece thoroughly. And when you take off that hardware, put it in a little baggie or somewhere so you can keep all of the pieces together. If there's hinges, I always recommend labeling them, which one's top left or bottom right, because especially with older pieces, it can be really hard to figure out which one goes back where to make it align correctly again. So just make sure you're keeping track of those kinds of things just to kind of make it easier in the long run for you. And then to clean the piece, you can use anything with degreasing agents. Um, I typically use a product called TSP Solution. That's a heavy duty degreaser. And I get that from Home Depot. But even just using Dawn dish soap with warm water and a microfiber cloth works great. And it's cheap and it's probably something you already have around the house. So you wanna clean the entire piece thoroughly. And once you wipe off the cleaner with a cloth, go back in with a clean damp cloth with just water on it and wipe the whole piece again to get rid of any residue that might be left over on it. And this will give a good clean surface for you to move on to the next step. The cleaning step is also a really great opportunity to get up close and personal with the piece in a way that you might not have been when you were first picking it up or choosing it for this project. So you end up flipping it upside down, pulling out any drawers, and taking a really thorough look at the piece, and then determine if there's any damage that needs to be addressed or fixed. 
for your first piece, do your best to choose something that doesn't have any damage or has very minimal because again, that's just one more added step that could add resistance to you successfully completing the project and enjoying yourself while doing it. It's best to try to avoid having to do repairs at first unless you like a challenge, but if you do find any, this is the stage where you would fix it and figure it out. So step three is plan out your design and don't be scared about trying out something that you might not be able to do. Remember that you can always take it off and start from scratch if it doesn't turn out the way that you had envisioned. Again, nothing is permanent and this is why we start with a small, inexpensive piece so that you don't go into it with fear and just dreading failure. Sometimes you might not know right away what direction that you want to take with a piece. So sometimes getting into this cleaning and prep stage allows you to spend more time with the piece before having to make those decisions to get a feel for it. However, I do know that some people like to do this designing stage before they start doing anything on a piece. So you can work this in kind of wherever feels best for you. Some people look at a piece and it just speaks to them and they know immediately what they want to do for, like with it or for it. And that's even better because then you can just roll with it and you don't have to spend too much time. But essentially, in this design phase, you're going to want to think about things like, do I want to paint this piece? If so, what color? Do I want to stain this piece? If so, what color? And will the wood and any damage that might be present allow for that? Or should, should I do a painted and stained combo? Do I want to keep the existing hardware as is? Or do I want to update the existing hardware to a different color? Or do I want to switch it out altogether? If I do want to switch it out altogether, am I going to have to do any patching of the existing holes? All of these things are important to think about before you dive into the project. But also, sometimes I don't know what direction I want to take with the hardware until everything else is done. So don't beat yourself up if you don't know exactly what you want to do right off the bat. Sometimes it's easier to see it once it all starts coming together and then you get inspired. And sometimes if I really can't visualize it in my head how a piece is going to look with a certain design that I have kind of brewing in my head, um, I'll use Canva or another similar app or functionality to create a mood board type of thing with a before photo of the furniture piece, a swatch that I find online of the paint color that I'm thinking of using, and then a photo of the hardware that I'm thinking of. This kind of helps me get a visual representation of what it will all look like when it comes together, sort of at least, because usually the colors differ a little bit in person as compared to how they look online, but it's handy if you're more of a visual person like me. Another good thing to use is something like PowerPoint or Google Slides, just something that allows you to quickly bring in, import those photos and just kind of move them around and switch them out until it feels right. So moving on to step number four, this involves prepping the piece. So if you're planning on painting the piece, you will need to scuff sand with a high grit sandpaper. And if you don't know what high grit means, basically the numbers that you see on sandpaper packaging refers to the grit level. So the lower the number, the rougher the grit. So the more that it will really just eat away at that finish. And then the higher the grit, the smoother it is. And the more it just kind of evens out that top surface of the finish just to smooth it out. For scuff sanding, I choose usually around 220 grit, but the goal here is basically you don't want to fully strip the piece down to its naked or bare state, but you want to get rid of any glossy finish or top coat that might be on there to get to the layer beneath it. Um, so you can do this by hand or with an electric sander if you have one. Either will work. One will obviously just require more effort, but honestly, it is a great arm workout. And I personally recommend scuff sanding any piece you plan on painting just to be on the safe side because it does help the paint that you will be putting on the piece to adhere better. Though I know for marketing purposes, some paints say that no prep is required. Just, just do it. However, if you want to sand and stain your piece instead of painting, you're going to want to strip the piece back to its bare wood. So you'll start out by using a lower grit sandpaper, like 100 or 80-ish, and get whatever you can off with that and then gradually continue to switch out the sandpaper to a higher grit. So you might do 100 and then 150 and then 180 and then 220 and then 300. There's definitely more work that goes into this route and it's basically so that it ends up with a really nice finish. So you're not just having that rough kind of 80 to 100 grit that you started with and leaving it with that. You wanna work your way up in the grits to get finer and finer so that it's kind of closing that wood grain in and making it really silky smooth. But if you do wanna just do it quick and dirty, I would say do like 100 and then 200-ish and then call it a day. Just know that with more time, you can finesse this a bit 
And if you're wanting to go down to bare wood, you can do it by hand. But if it's a big piece especially, I recommend relying on some technology to help you out by grabbing a cheap orbital sander. During this step, you may also choose to prime your piece. Again, typically it's better just to do it and not have to worry about the possibility of getting to the end of the project and realizing you needed to prime, didn't, and now that you need to go back and start from scratch. What priming does, especially primers that have stain blocking properties, is help to work as a protective layer between the wood and whatever it is that you're painting and the paint. So when you're painting wood, especially wood that's been freshly sanded, it can release what is called wood tannins, which come up to the surface over time. And especially if you paint with a light color, they can seep through the paint and it almost looks like a grease stain or mark in the finish. It can sometimes not come out right away and it might be over a couple hours, days. Sometimes it takes a lot longer than that, but it's super annoying when it happens. I've made the mistake many times. So again, I just recommend doing it from the beginning to avoid that frustration. And as an aside, for whatever products you choose to use for your furniture makeover, again, just make sure that you're reading the directions for the proper prep and use of them because the directions will always let you know how to make the product perform to its fullest. The next step, step five, is either staining or painting your piece. So we will discuss more in detail how to hand paint effectively in upcoming podcast episodes, but multiple thin, light coats are generally the way to do it instead of trying to get full coverage right away. Also, if you're painting wood or something made to emulate the look of wood, always paint in the direction of the wood grain and it will give you the best finish. So if you see the wood grain going left to right, that's the direction that you're going to paint with your paintbrush. And if you're staining, it's always best to use a wood conditioner prior to staining to get the best, most even finish. Again, I'll discuss more in depth in upcoming episodes how to stain the different types out there and all that other fun stuff. And as you tackle this part of the process, I want to remind you that it doesn't have to be perfect. And the only way that you're going to get closer to it being perfect or as close to perfect as we can get is by practicing and being open to learning. So read the directions. If it makes you feel better, look up some tutorials on YouTube and just jump into it. Taking on this first project will give you an idea of what the process is like, which steps need to be done and in what order. And then in time, you can start researching specific things within each step to help you fine tune. For example, how to get the smoothest looking finish when you're hand painting. So after you let it dry, make sure that you take a look at the directions on the product you're using. Am I sounding like a broken record yet? And read what the ideal recoding time is. Some products have very specific instructions depending on their properties. So you might be able to add a second coat after something like two hours. Or you might have to add a second coat within the hour or only after 48 hours. So it can vary a ton. So use those directions as a map leading you through the project. And then add on as many coats as you need until you get the desired look or level of opaqueness. Then you might decide to just end there or you might want to add top coat as a protective layer to your piece. Which would bring us to step six, which is top coating and protecting. So there are a few different finishes that you might decide to use and we can dive deeper into these in a later episode, but you are typically looking at either using a wax or a polyurethane. Sometimes people will opt for a resin or an epoxy too, but the first two are what I personally tend to use and see most commonly used and they're the easier options to start out with for a beginner. For protecting high traffic areas and pieces that will get a lot of use, such as tabletops, dresser tops, and nightstands, I recommend using a polyurethane, or a poly as it's commonly referred to, because it provides a more protective layer than just a wax would. Again, read the directions on your product because there's a lot of different considerations in terms of recoat times and cleanup, depending on if it's a water-based poly or an oil-based poly. But once cured, a wax does offer durability as well. I just don't typically recommend it for these high traffic areas, just in case. I find that the poly does have um, some added durability elements to it, so that's why I typically go that route. And then once you're done with however many layers of top coat you want on the piece, you're going to want to reassemble it. So if you have drawers that you took out, put them back in. And if you took off any hardware, put it back on or add on the new hardware if you decided to switch it out. Once you have finished with the makeover, even if everything is dry to the touch and you feel like it's good to go, make sure that you're gentle with the piece for the next three weeks as the paint and or the top coat will require about 21 to 30 days to fully cure. 
during this time, don't be dragging any decor across it or placing glasses on it without a coaster and other reckless behavior, or else you might damage it. And you just worked really hard on it, so don't do that. After the 30 day mark, you can be a little bit more footloose and fancy free with it, but I still always recommend using a coaster for drinks, adding soft pads under decor that will be sitting on the piece that might get moved around frequently, and avoid using chemical cleaners on the piece. A lightly dampened microfiber cloth should do the trick for cleaning and removing dust. And then take a step back and really appreciate the work that you have done. You just completed your first furniture makeover. Yes! The staging and photographing stage really does this for me because I get to see the finished product in good lighting, maybe with decor on it, and see it from new angles. If this isn't a necessary step and you're just doing the project to put it into your own space so you don't necessarily need to be like taking photos and making sure the lighting's all good to go, just take the time to step back and take a look at it in your home and just be like, fuck yeah, I did that all by myself. Believe me when I say it is a great feeling and you'll continue to feel that pride when you look at that piece moving forward. So just let it sink in. And as a reminder, if you do find yourself getting frustrated or tired during the process, just allow yourself to take breaks if you need to step away or clear your mind. The best part of furniture refinishing for me is that you can work on it for just five minutes a day and still see progress in your pieces. So don't overwhelm yourself with the expectation that you need to sit down and whip through the whole thing in one sitting. Another great thing about these projects is that there are mandated breaks during drying times. So unless you have multiple projects you're working on at once, you can go back to doing another task or a project while you wait for the stain, paint, or top coat to fully dry according to the directions. I hope this was helpful to you if you have never explored taking on a furniture makeover of your own. Remember to not sweat the small stuff. You will get better in time and we all had to start somewhere. If you're feeling inspired to take on your first project, come let me know what it is and what your plan for it is. I always love when my community shares their projects and the process with me, and I'm honestly always amazed and so proud of them when they show me the final amazing product. And if you are someone who has already tackled a makeover before, I want to know, what was your first furniture project? Honestly, how did it go? And how great did you feel afterwards? Head on over to my Instagram at Mel Did It Herself and find the post for episode number four, Refinishing Your First Furniture Piece, and let me know in the comments. Like I mentioned before, I talk about the questionable approach that I took for my first project, and that ended up working out in the end in episode one, which I will link in the show notes below. And something you may not know about me, I love little motivational messages. They literally always get me fired up, and I keep a running list of ones that are especially catchy or speak to me in the notes app on my phone. So I'm going to end every podcast episode with one of those that I have noted down over the years in hopes that you leave our time here each week feeling inspired, motivated, and ready to take on whatever comes your way this week. So this week's Mel's motivational message is, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. So remember that as you head into the next week, that starting and taking that first step is the only thing you need to tackle. As long as you decide to start and just take the next right step, you will eventually walk yourself into the greatness that I just know you have within you. Even if you can't see it right now, I see it, I'm here, and I'm cheering you on, my friend. And if you are enjoying the podcast so far, I would love if you would go to the podcast page on whatever platform you're listening on today and leave me a review, preferably five stars, but I'll leave that part up to you because that will just help get this pushed out organically to more people to discover and join us on this furniture refinishing ride. All right, that's it for now. I appreciate your time and I'll catch you guys next week.